Alrighty, good day, everyone. My name is Catherine Fleva. I'm the Clinical Application Specialist with the Hexoskin team, and I'll be the host of this webinar. In the background, I have my sales and marketing team who will be monitoring the chat and answering any questions you may have during the webinar. And we're pleased to welcome two guest speakers today who are the stars of our presentation. They will present some of the current work they have with their Hexoskin. And their work really focuses on building databases and identifying biomarkers that develop uh, that can be used to develop artificial intelligence or AI models that can be applied in real time to manage the health of people, both in healthcare and in workplace uh, applications. Dr. Ali Bou Asi from the University of Montreal and Abhimanyu Sharotri from Texas State University. Thank you both for taking the time to join us today. On the agenda, first we'll briefly explore how the global strategy for the future of health is digital and how our open connected health platform and data flow enables our client ecosystem to work on these big goals, like developing digital biomarkers. Then we will switch gears and uh, talk a little bit and hear from our guest speakers about how the Hexoskin platform is actually enabling the development of these types of models in applications where we can predict seizures in patients or fatigue in workplaces in the workers. And finally, we'll leave some questions, uh, some time for questions for a Q&A session at the end. And before we get started, I just want to go over some housekeeping. So the webinar will be recorded and a link will be provided to all of the registered attendees later this week. And if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A chat at the bottom uh, to ask any sort of questions, which we can address during the webinar or at the Q&A at the end. All right, let's get started. According to global experts, the future of health is digital health. Digital health is the broad multidisciplinary concept that links technology with healthcare. And as a result, in 2020, the World Health Organization created a global strategy on digital health that promotes the health well-being for everyone, everywhere, at all ages. Now, our work at Hexoskin is very much in alignment with this global strategy. Our mission aims to make the precise health data collected by our smart garments accessible and useful for everyone. So before we delve into our platform, let's take a brief look at the history of digital health and artificial intelligence. The first uses of technology in medicine was in the late 1800s when the first medical diagnosis was given over the telephone. But it really wasn't until the 1950s and 60s that we started applying the concept that computers could be indistinguishable from humans at analyzing data. And as a result, machine learning and artificial intelligence were born. As technologies have advanced over the last 70 years, we've been able to collect and read larger sets of data, which fuels the advancement of AI and deep learning and enables various digital solutions across healthcare ranging from mobile health to virtual assistants and chatbots that can help with both clinical and non-clinical work. And most recently, we've seen the application of AI really come to life with the FDA's creation of the Digital Health Authority and their approval of deep learning for health applications and clinical trials. Now, in the U.S., the FDA has some guidance around what are connected or digital devices, and they refer to them as digital health technologies. So let's explore that concept a little bit further. Overall, digital health technologies use computing platforms, connectivity, software, and sensors for health and healthcare related uses. The broad scope of technologies includes mobile health, wearable devices, telehealth and telemedicine, along with health information technology, all of which use sensors and software to collect data and develop solutions like personalized medicine that can be applied to, uh, that can apply targeted therapies, for example, to both individuals or groups of patients. Now, digital health technologies may be hardware or software, but often they're a combination of the two, and they allow us to easily collect continuous or periodic data. This data is then used to build the databases needed for the development of artificial intelligence models. So AI encapsulates a broad set of computer science algorithms that are used to read, learn, act, and adapt based on data inputs, just like humans would, but much faster than humans uh, can possibly do. 
So machine learning is a subset of AI that uses statistical methods to develop algorithms whose performance improves as they learn from more data over time. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning where multi-layered neural networks learn from even larger data sets. And as we can see, the development of these types of models really depends on applying data science techniques to big data sets, training algorithms, and then applying them to unstructured data in real time with the goal of making predictions or decisions. However, the current uh, development and application of AI in healthcare is not all mature. Currently, AI has very good applications with imaging and lab data, where we see a better adoption today because the data sets already exist, they're already digital, and within that data, there's a lot of repetitive tasks that can be used for learning and identifying features. However, most of the data is still dirty and requires data cleaning, conditioning, and statistical modeling to be applied, which accounts for about 90% of the work in AI development. Here we can see an example of an algorithm architecture from one of our clients who's using HexoSkin to collect and classify acceleration data. We see that even with one sensor being used, there are multiple steps for training and segmenting the data, along with a two-stage classification model plus deep learning in order to be able to automatically identify whether a user with the HexoSkin is standing, walking, or sitting while wearing the HexoSkin. And so as a result, we can see the product life cycle for day-to-day -day health monitoring, where we can apply in real-time recommendations, alerts, and flags is still very limited. And access to clean data is a major challenge for researchers and clinicians. So this is where our solution comes in. Our open connected health platform allows our clients to be able to collect big data sets that can be then used for developing these types of day-to-day -day monitoring solutions. So let's get into our platform. Hare Technologies was founded in 2006 and we are based out of Montreal, Canada. We've built a value proposition that allows us to support clients across various industries. And this is delivered by leveraging two end-to-end -end platforms, the HexoSkin Connected Health Platform and the AstroSkin Vital Signs Monitoring Platform. We also design and manufacture health sensors, which are targeted seamlessly into our smart clothing. And we've also built a complete infrastructure, which allows the collection of real world data which can be leveraged by our software tools that provide data management, analytics, and reporting to help you make sense of all of this data, which again can be applied across various industries. So in terms of our smart clothing, the shirts themselves have been designed with features that make them reusable and durable without any compromise for comfort or portability. And in fact, our shirts have been used by over 10,000 users to date, and with, we have sizes that cover most populations. In terms of the HexoSkin smart device, this is used to store and record health data collected from the smart shirt. The recording device collects um, up to 42,000 data points per minute, can get up to 36 hours of continuous data recording, and stores up to 100 days of raw data storage directly on the de device. So this allows our clients to build the data sets they need for AI model development. Along the same lines, we have tools uh, for developers with our SDK license that allows them to access raw and process data in real time directly from the HexoSkin device. So let's take a look now at what our shirts can collect. HexoSkin is a very precise tool to monitor cardiac, respiratory, and activity data continuously. The HexoSkin shirt has a one-lead ECG that is collected through three embedded textile dry electrodes, and we provide data on heart rate, heart rate variability, and the QRS complex itself. We also have two embedded integrated um, respiratory inductance plethysmography sensors around the thorax and the abdomen, which reports on breathing rate, minute ventilation, tidal volume, and inspiration and expiration events. And finally, we have a three-axis accelerometer, which is housed within the smart device that is located in the side pocket, and it collects data on actigraphy, activity levels, and step count. Now, for those who are looking to develop more complex multimodal models, 
In addition to the cardio, respiratory, and activity sensors in the Hexoskin Smart Shirt, the AstroSkin also provides data on pulse oximetry, systolic blood pressure, and skin temperature. Additionally, the AstroSkin has the three lead ECG instead of a one lead ECG, which provides more data for those looking to develop more advanced cardiac screening models, for example. If you are interested in learning more about these platforms and how they work, reach out to us and we'll be able to share with you our live demos going into more details about how the platforms themselves work. Now, to gain access to all of this data, we provide a one sync pool, which allows data synchronization, both for the Hexoskin and AstroSkin, all in one uh, software package. The OneSync allows our clients to download the raw data directly from the smart device onto their local system, or it gives you the option to pass by our servers for signal processing and then download the raw and process data from our web dashboard. At the same time, we are also continuing to support developers with a completely new SDK, which we call One SDK. And the One SDK allows you to create apps and real-time data streaming for both Hexoskin and AstroSkin. So for more information about these tools, please reach out to our sales team. So as you can see, we offer a complete end-to-end -end system that opens up endless possibilities for researchers, clinicians, and industry leaders to develop AI models with our smart garments, our smart device, and our OneSync software for seamless data synchronization. And our One, one SDK allows developers and organizations to utilize our data in real time. Now, over the years, our research community has been busy with our connected platforms, and we have over 22 validation studies can, uh, against the gold standard along with about 160 publications and growing across various types of um, uh, themes. So if you want more information about our publications, please reach out to our team or visit our website, and we'd be happy to share some of those publications with you. And I've included here a quick list of some notable references within the AI and ML space that's been also growing recently. So again, you can access the full list of references on our website, or you can reach out to our team and we'd be happy to share that with you. Now, without further ado, I would like to present Dr. Ali Bouassi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Montreal, and a researcher and uh, principal scientist at Tom Enivado in Montreal. His principal research interests cover the application of artificial intelligence techniques and the Internet of Things to improve the management of neurological and psychiatric conditions. Dr. Bouassi, thank you for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be among you today and briefly discuss how our team, our team is using the Hexoskin Smart uh, Garment within the context of epilepsy. Thank you uh, for the invitation. To make it more practical, I start my presentation by showing you what an epileptic seizures look like as recorded by the surveillance camera of the cashier in Colorado. She came up to pay for her soda. I was working in the back of the store, rearranging a few things. I came up to the counter to help her and I talked to her right there and she answered me, no problem or anything. And I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, I love babies. So I wanted to see if I could get the baby to, to talk to me or smile or anything. And all of a sudden the girl had a glazed look over her face and I knew something wasn't registering with her. So I grabbed the baby's arm and I was trying to say, do you need help? Do I need to get somebody? What's wrong? And she just was, lost in space, her looks. So I thought, I gotta take this baby before something happens. And right there, she just, she falls. And I don't even remember grabbing her, but I couldn't hang on to her. So I yelled for a customer that was in the store. This is a video that is publicly available on YouTube. And the reason why I decided to show you this one in particular is to highlight how recurrent, spontaneous, but most importantly, unpredictable epileptic seizures are. Epilepsy is surprisingly a common condition that affects one out of 100 people in the world. And here in Canada, every day, an average of 42 new cases are recorded. While first line of treatment consists of anti-epileptic drug therapy, more than a third of patients with epilepsy do not respond to medications. And this is a large number considering the high prevalence of epilepsy. Epilepsy surgery is recommended, is recommended when medication fails, but according to the World Health Organization, up to 5% of patients only are candidate 
epilepsy brain surgery. According to a 2016 survey led by the Epilepsy Foundation, the most significantly disabling aspect of epilepsy was the unpredictable nature of seizures, what creates a constant source of worriment for patients and put them at a high risk of injury. Some of the difficulties and challenges faced nowadays while treating patients with epilepsy can be overcome by designing algorithms able to detect seizures and implementing them into closed-loop advisory devices. And here we can see a nice illustration of how wearables can be used within the context of epilepsy as adapted from a publication by Ilta Campus and colleagues in, uh, published in Seizures in 2016. And in the proposed architecture, we can see a seizure detection wearable that can detect seizures in real time and send alerts to a caregiver or patient's relative, but also transfer the data or the signal to a data processing unit for subsequent analysis. Wearable-based seizure detection will be of great benefits to patients with epilepsy, parents, caretakers, or healthcare professionals. For instance, alerts would reduce seizure-related industry and uh, in injuries, I'm sorry, and mortality by alerting patients' relatives and caregivers. With automated seizure diaries, physicians would have a more reliable and objective method for monitoring therapy than patients' recollection, for example, during clinical visits. And it also will, it will also help reducing stress and anxiety for both caregivers and patients. While developing these devices, it's important to obtain the patient's point of view. And in collaboration with the Canadian Epilepsy Alliance and the FEFC Section Quebec, which are Canadian patient organizations, a survey was sent by our group across Canada in 2020 to collect the point of view and perspectives of patients regarding seizure detection devices. And here we can see a screenshot of the website of the Canadian Epilepsy Alliance uh, back in uh, January 2020. A total of 382 responses were obtained during the two months during which the survey was available. And interestingly, 97% of patients with epilepsy and 99% of caregivers expressed interest in seizure detection devices based on wearable devices. Uh, most would use seizure detectors continuously in conjunction with the seizure diary and wanted automated alarms. So I'll refer you to the publication that was published in 2020 in Epilepsy and Behavior, but I'll give you an, just a sample question to give you an idea what, what the survey looked like. Here, patients and caregivers were asked to rate on a scale from one to five, with one being the minimal concern, how worried they felt about different items in a seizure detection uh, device. So as we can see here, respondents were le least concerned about the device's appearance and most concerned about false negatives, and cost and comfort were also other major concerns of, for the patients. So at the end of this work, based on patients' preferences, we provided a list of guidelines for user-centered seizure detectors, such as those related to cost, design, performance, battery life, and privacy. This is available also in the paper. We are currently testing the possibility of using the Hexoskin smart shirt to detect epileptic seizures. Uh, and to do so, our first step is to acquire data at the University of Montreal Hospital Center, or SHUM, Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, uh, for continuous, so patients are admitted for continuous video EEG monitoring for clinical purposes, such as, for example, to confirm the epileptic nature of uh, paroxysmal events, to localize the epileptic focus prior to epileptic surgery, or to monitor seizure frequency while therapy is being adjusted. And we ask uh, the patients, if they accept, to continuously wear the Hexoskin Smart Shirt during their stay at the epilepsy monitoring unit. And here we can see a summary of our acquisition protocol. So after patients are recruited and have signed a consent form stating that they understood the project and they accept to participate, they are asked to fill a pre-recording survey, which report their preferences regarding seizure detection devices, similar to the survey that uh, we, we, I showed in a few slides before to a stand across Canada. And then we install the Hexoskin and report for the duration of their stay at the EMU, which is usually around two weeks. And uh, every day we change the we change the hexoskin device every 24 hours, and at the end of their stay, the hexoskin is removed, and the patients are asked again to fill a post reporting survey about their experience with the hexoskin smart shirt. Then data are downloaded to be analyzed for the development of the seizure detection device. Meanwhile, seizures are being annotated by an expert epileptologist so on the clinical side based on video, continuous video EEG recordings, blindly to the hexoskin data. So this is 
uh, what EEG signals look like. It's the recording of the brain's electrical activity as uh, recorded with electrodes uh, glued to the scalp. And uh, here I I I, uh, I masked it for for privacy purposes, but we have the videos, we have the video EEG, and uh, the clinician will annotate the seizure onset based on video EEG recordings blindly to the exoskin uh, data set, the, the exoskin data. And this is a good feature actually of the exoskin that allows uh, that allows to have a universal uh, time that allows to. Uh, take these annotations and apply them to exoskin recordings. And here we can see that video EEG-based annotations are automatically imported to mark seizure onset and offset on the exoskin recordings blindly to the video EEG. And this is a screen capture of our local uh, Python-based processing pipeline. And highlighted in orange, which we can see now, is a focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizure. To follow up on that, during their stay at the epilepsy monitoring unit, patients experience different types of seizures, and we should keep in mind that seizures are relatively rare events, even at the epilepsy monitoring unit. And in our project, we adopted the recommendation of the International League Against Epilepsy to classify these seizures into focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizures, which are the seizures with the most clinical manifestations and usually the easiest to detect. Also, focal impaired awareness seizure, focal aware seizures, and we also record other types of seizures, given that we don't know what we'll be recording, uh, electrical seizures, psychotronic non-epileptic seizures, etc. So here's an example of a focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizure, as I mentioned. So these are the seizures with the most clinical manifestations, highlighted in orange. Here, so this is the clinical the seizure onset as annotated on video EEG recordings. This is a video offset, and we can notice the changes even at the level of raw data after seizure onset. So in the next few slides, I'll show you how our team is uh, developing a seizure detection algorithm based on data acquired with the Hexoskin Smart Shirt. So uh, as a disclosure, I won't show, be showing quantitative uh, results because we don't have them yet. We're still working on, on, on the results, and this is unpublished data, but I thought that this webinar would be an opportunity to, to show you how to develop these kind of algorithms. So this is a work in progress. And we should keep in mind that the type of seizures I'm showing here is the one with the most clinical manifestations and thus the easiest to detect. So this is the ECG, so the electrocardiogram as, as presented by Catherine. And we have the accelerometers, so the movement sensors, and we have respiration, and this is the seizure. And our team is working on detecting these seizures based on the hexoskin uh, data. So our classification problem is to detect this seizure here, which is the area highlighted in orange. To better understand this classification problem, let's imagine that we're flying over a forest and we want to identify this kind of trees, which correspond to seizures. So the first question to ask is, what characteristics allow identifying these kind of trees? Perhaps it could be the shape of the leaf, their color, their size, uh, the size of the leaf, etc. So this step is, is, is called feature extraction, and it's a very important step when dealing with physiological signals. So for an ECG, it would be the heart rate, heart rate availability, etc. For, for a breathing uh, signal, it would be the breathing volume. For a movement signal, it could be the activity, etc. However, if we look at this slide, we realize that we cannot extract these characteristics of the whole forest say in a single step, what we will do is that we will grab our photo camera and take one photo at a time. And for each photo, we compute the characteristics, and this is what we call a moving window. And then we keep on moving until we cover the whole area, whole signal in our case. So this is the concept, another important concept, you know, a moving window. So we learn feature extraction using a moving window, and the same as we mentioned, applied to physiological recordings, so features such as heart rate, heart rate variability, reading volume are extracted using a moving window. And here we can see what extracted features look like during, the, during an hour prior to a seizure as recorded by, by the hexoskin. So these are the features. The seizure is here. This is the seizure onset. This is the seizure offset in, in red with the red vertical bars. And here we have accelerometer features, heart rate variability, linear features, nonlinear features. So I won't be going into the details of the features, but it's interesting to see that this is the signature of the seizure, and if we focus only on accelerometer features, we can see that we have a sort of activations or peak of activity 
here and here and here that would resemble to a certain extent a seizure. And this is normal because the accelerometer sensor is measuring movement and we are recording movement during the seizure. And that's highlight why it's important or why we need multimodal recordings to combine the strengths of each sensor. So in this presentation today, we'll be focusing only on accelerometers and HR HRV, so ECG-based features. Once features are extracted, the, the major step in the seizure detection algorithm is classification. So here we will try to find a decision function to classify different states using extracted characteristics. So to simplify uh, for visualization purpose, we'll be to go back to our forest example, we'll be having only two features, the color of the leaf and the shape of the leaf. And in 2D, each tree is represented by a point on this 2D plot based on characteristics. For example, a tree with uh, this tree with a lighter green color and a more of a curved shaped leaf will be on the bottom left here, and a tree with a darker green color and uh, more of a round shaped leaf will be on the top right. And then we apply our concept of moving window, and then we have these two distributions of purple circles or points and red circles. And the problem consists in finding the line which could separate the purple circles from the red circle. And as we can see, several lines exist. That's why classifiers have been proposed to maximize generalization capability. And by generalization capability, we mean the capability of the classifier of correctly identifying a new tree, in our case, or a new point in physiological recordings that, haven't, that it hadn't seen during the training set. So for example, a support vector machine will look for the line or the hyperplane, which will maximize the distance between the two closest training points. In this slide here, we can see the classifier's output after training and it's being tested here on the held out test set as compared to raw data. So this is the raw data. This is zoomed out. So we have one hour of continuous recording prior to the seizure. This is, if you remember, well, this is the focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizure, which was highlighted in orange. This is here, the annotations. So in, it will be highlighted in gray here. And this is the binary classifier output. So at zero, we are in the interictal state. At one, we are in the ictal state. So we are in the seizure state. And we can see that while we correctly identify the seizure, so at the seizure level, we, are, we have an output of one and a bit after also due to the moving window effect, we have few isolated false alarms during the ictal period, during the interictal period, so during the normal state, which is the hour preceding the seizures. And this is currently the main challenge with wearable devices for seizure detection, the high false alarm or false detection rate. So if we consider, let's say, that these are isolated alarms, and we do a little bit of math, so this is the hour prior to the seizure, we'll have five false alarms during this hour. A way to deal with this issue is to add a post-processing step to reduce false alarm rates, so to improve specificity. I won't be going into the details of this step, but what we'll do mainly is we apply sort of a filter, which will limit the generation of alarms to periods during which successive predictions of being in the ictal state are high. So our new output, instead of being the black dots, will become this green bar here. And we will only generate alarms when this continuous red line crosses a predefined threshold in an ascending way. So as we can see here, we generated the green alarm during the seizure, during the seizure period. The higher the threshold is, the better the specificity. So we'll generate, we, we won't be crossing this line, but we will have to compromise on sensitivity and latency. In terms of sensitivity, in this example, for both a high and low threshold, we can still detect the seizure. So we have generated an alarm. We, are, we have the green line is in the correct interval. However, this seizure, like this is a nice example, nice illustration I'm showing you, during which the seizure is of sufficient duration, like is, is, is long enough that we can still detect the seizure. But however, with a seizure of a shorter duration, we might miss the seizure with a high threshold. And now if we zoom a bit into this, uh, into this part here, into the seizure to talk about latency a bit. And as a reminder, so the seizure is highlighted in gray. This is the seizure onset. This is the seizure offset, so the end of the seizure. And the green line is our generated alarm. 
we can see that um, the alarm or the green the green color bar is generated earlier with respect to the seizure onset with a lower threshold as compared to a higher threshold. So this threshold allows us also, as I mentioned, to define a compromise between sensitivity, specificity, and also detection latency. Another way that we are exploring now to, to reduce alarm rates is by combining multiple uh, modalities. So the data I've shown today, these very preliminary data are based on ECG and uh, movement sensors only. And now we are actively working on incorporating our third modality, which is respiration into our seizure detection algorithm. I see that I have a bit less than two minutes, so a few words on another project that is currently taking place in the lab. Uh, so what we are exploring, actually taking benefit of this database that's been recorded to evaluate the sleep as recorded by the Hexoskin shirt in patients with epilepsy admitted uh, to the epilepsy monitoring unit. I won't go into the details of the study due to time constraint, but our preliminary results uh, show that sleep efficiency as recorded by the hexoskin worn by patients with epilepsy admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit was significantly lower during nights preceding seizure dates. So this is another example of how we can use this data. This concludes my presentation. So today we saw that wearables and the, the hexoskin smart shirt as used in our lab offers a tempting opportunity for seizure detection and patient monitoring and that combining multiple sources of information and contribute to better seizure detection algorithms. However, current challenges lie in reducing false alarm rates while maintaining a high and acceptable sensitivity and detection latency. And today I showed you how it works on focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures, which are the easiest kind of seizures to detect. So our next challenge also will be to explore different, how this translates to different types of seizures with less obvious clinical manifestations. Also, what I will discuss today was at the epilepsy monitoring unit. So during the stay of their pa the patients for around two weeks, this is where we record uh, the signals. So uh, another, another also per perspective and challenge will be to evaluate how these recordings are in a residential setting where, uh, where patients uh, uh, do usual daily activities. So my thanks are due to our funding agencies, collaborators. I would like also to take this, uh, this opportunity to, thanks the, to thank the Hexoskin teams who constantly provide excellent support and very fast uh, answers and help to our team. I would like to thank our team and Dr. Nguyen, who has been a great mentor since the start of my career and uh, is my collaborator on the clinical side and definitely to you for your attention. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dr. Buasi, for the great lesson on feature extraction and classification using the HexoSkin and how our multimodal system is really helping uh, to advance that modeling um, feature de detection for you in terms of seizure detection. We're really looking forward to your upcoming publications and seeing your models being applied to residential settings in various different types of uh, seizures to improve patient care. So if you do need more information about Dr. Buasi's work, you can use the QR code here on the screen to link over to his website and contact him for more questions if needed. Thank you again. And up next, we're going to turn it over to Abhimanyu, who is a dynamic research project manager and grant specialist with a deep knowledge of industrial, mechanical, and manufacturing engineering systems. So we're going to transition from a healthcare space back into or into a workplace setting. Uh, Abhimanyu has a master's in industrial engineering from Texas State University, where he continues to work at the Center for High Performance Systems in developing digital twin factories and industrial avatars for manufacturing and materials handling applications. Abhimanyu, let's turn it over to you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Super excited to be here. On uh, behalf of uh, the Center of High Performance Systems, uh, in the Ingram School of Engineering at Texas State University. I'm uh, honored uh, to present our research on digital twins for material handling uh, operators in Industry 4.0. Uh, this, I believe, is our take uh, to contribute by research uh, to the ever-growing uh, and transforming field of Industry 4.0 and uh, digital twins. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm working at the Ingram School of Engineering as a grant specialist, pursuing my passion for R&D, research and development. So I received my bachelor's 
in mechanical engineering from SRM University, India, and my master's in industrial engineering uh, from Texas State University. So what keeps me going pursuing this field uh, is my curiosity to understand how we humans have come a long way from the era of uh, steam engines to connected world of Internet of Things. And the things like simulation of manufacturing systems, uh, worker ergonomics and safety, and the digital twins are of my very, very particular interest. Uh, since I started my journey here at Texas State uh, as a student in 2018. So uh, agenda of my today's presentation is going to be I'll be starting with a short background of our research, the developed methodology, uh, how we have been using data collected by uh, Higgs or Skin. Uh, and their platform to build mathematical models to predict fatigue in, an, in a worker. Uh, I have a short video demonstration for our audience here of our work and um, a sneak peek on current research that uh, our lab has been working on. All right. So uh, as we saw in the presentation today, we have been using data and combination of systems uh, for the human well-being in wide, wide variety of applications. And I'm sure the audience today is well aware of the technology around us. Always, it's not only assisting us, but it's actually taking decisions for us these days. So from recommending the best route that I take to go home to actually accurately predicting my coffee intake so I never run out of my favorite blend and so I can enjoy it every day and deliver it to my doorstep, like technology is doing everything for us. And uh, quite a lot of computation to take care of this in real time with all this data being fed uh, from multiple systems. So, and something at the core of this evolution is the idea of simulating the actual product in a controlled environment and testing the system, understanding it, not by only actually performing the test, but being able to predict the behavior of the system. That's the art of simulation and putting it to words. It can be defined as a realistic reenactment of a real world scenario, uh, for multiple reasons under test conditions. And now what if I told you that uh, we have successfully built simulation models that can assess a machine's capabilities in real time and assist the team who's working with that apparatus or that machine with useful stats uh, in real time. So no longer waiting for the test results using advanced algorithms, we can actually accurately predict the next downtime of the machine, assisting uh, the companies were taking massive decisions, taking great decisions on operator scheduling, throughput, uh, the downtime, and a lot of other useful statistics. So this simulation model, when it's capable of uh, replicating a system in real time, simulating its physical state and behavior, it's actually called a digital twin. It's unique. So digital twins are all around us in one way or another, working constantly to actually monitor uh, machinery, warehouses, uh, production facilities to increase the reliability of their components and uh, lower waste and increase profits. So these technological marvels called digital twins, they're not only limited to manufacturing sector these days. Uh, Singapore, one of the world's densely populated nation has now created uh, the very first digital twin of an entire nation. They have mapped the geographic and infrastructure data of the entire nation. And uh, this system is now helping the government uh, with policy making, planning, operations, risk management. And we can all imagine what the gains of such system in place would be. So with all these available technologies, it's us, the humans, at the center of this technological evolution. So yes, we have robots assisting us with everything, but those super smart machines, they don't really hold the capabilities to uh, replace us yet. So according to Data USA, uh, as of May 2021, 1.08 million people uh, were actually employed in the warehousing and storage industry. So, and 40.4% of the human workforce, they actually performed still manual material handling jobs as their daily work, like picking, placing, fulfilling all the orders. And material handling is actually considered one of the most physically demanding tasks in a workplace. And it can quickly become a leading factor contributing to a worker's accumulation of mental 
and physical fatigue. And quick fact, the research is actually collecting all the data of uh, uh, like uh, it's an injuries, illnesses and fatalities program of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. They are collecting data since 1972 and it actually shows that the injuries and illnesses have reduced, but they're not done yet. It's still taking place and there's still a need of research to make workers safe on a job. So musculoskeletal disorders cause, they can actually, they actually account for over one third of all the workplace injuries. And these injuries, they not only harm the workforce, but also cost employers more than uh, around like $13.4 billion every year. That's, that's a huge number. So we humans, we plan to incorporate all these advanced technologies like digital twins for analyzing machines 24 uh, seven, but very, very limited attempts have been made to actually connect this digital twin technology to human operators working in a factory environment. And uh, our research at Texas State University tends to bridge that gap uh, to provide a framework to build a true digital twin of an operator in today's Industry 4.0 environment. So starting in 2015, when our research team worked on a Kaizen project to actually develop a simulation process for human motions, we used four mo optical motion capture cameras. Uh, we, we actually lended those from the Department of Health and Human Performance to understand the technology in field. So that gained our interest. We started developing this idea and uh, next came in a funding from NEC as a gift to actually continue the research, adding four more cameras to our research and our inventory. So multiple internal and external grants later, now we have facilities from the School of Engineering, uh, faculties from the School of Engineering, Business, Health and Human Performance, all collaborating towards this particular project. And our lab is now, uh, we have a fleet of uh, 13, Motion, optical motion capture cameras from Colossus for biomechanical studies, multiple hexaskin smart suits for physiological body parameters. And uh, we also have uh, an, uh, a mobile electroencephalogram and EEG device uh, so we can have some research to continue our uh, efforts on uh, the cognitive sciences part as well. So we have come up, we have built a framework to actually construct a digital twin uh, for a material handling operator to detect fatigue as a factor of change in various body parameters, such as joint kinematics, uh, heart rate, breathing rate, et cetera. So this framework actually includes uh, four modules of development, data collection module, data pre-processing and storage module, analytics, and augmented reality. So the initial development starts collecting data. We got to understand what's going on. So we collected data in a controlled lab-based environment. We just, we started with replicating uh, fundamental moves performed uh, by a material handling operator, like lifting, pushing, pulling, uh, those kind of movements and uh, on different weights, different heights. And this data is then stored on our local database uh, and then analyzed to uh, build fatigue prediction on activity classification algorithms uh, using mathematical models. Uh, I think we had a great explanation of how AI and machine learning models can actually work uh, in the previous presentation. And that's actually the base of what we have been building on as well. And uh, then these models are then analyzed based on its end use case, because since every factory is different. So based on the use case, it's uh, then fed to an AI environment in real time, used for visualizing the activity with additional uh, statistics. And uh, the major outcomes of our research can uh, actually be summarized with this slide here, uh, where we have a digital twin lab with motion capture facilities serving as a platform to constantly advance and evolve the research in the field of material handling. Our concept of virtual worker, the digital twin, actually holds the abilities to collect, store, analyze and display data in real time. And the advanced data-driven fatigue models can actually predict human fatigue as a factor of rate of perceived exertion or for an operator taking into consideration various physiological factors. And collecting data since 2015, we hold a large repository of human motion capture data and physiological data performing fundamental skill moves uh, like lifting, lowering, pushing, pulling. 
and uh, the advanced visualizations and graphics of the worker uh, in real time for the capabilities to be projected using tools like Microsoft HoloLens 1, 2, uh, and also like Oculus for VR environments and building immersive environments in Unity. So that's what we have been using for our uh, augmented reality and virtual reality at Formville. So uh, today I'll be digging a bit deeper into the fatigue model aspect of our accomplishments, uh, where we have been using data from Hexus and smart suits to actually develop models to predict fatigue in a worker while they perform a manual material handling act. So I'm sure the audience is well, well aware of the multiple metrics that the smart garment allows us to record. Uh, ECG, heart rate variability, breathing rate, minute ventilation, uh, acceleration, calories, activity level, and step count. So uh, we wanted to investigate uh, what factors, what are the factors that actually affect the level of fatigue in a person uh, as they perform a lifting and lowering task in real time. So the study actually included data collection of uh, around 30 participants performing the task at different time intervals, like how much time, uh, in how much time interval do they do perform a lift or lower, uh, different weights, different height of the lift or lowering of the activity and so on. So along with the hexoskin data, we also uh, recorded the joint movements, as you can see the markers on the, uh, on, on the subject here. And, uh, uh, and the system that we used was the Qualysis motion capture system. And we also asked the subjects their self-reported rate of perceived exertion. Now, emphasizing on uh, the rate of perceived exertion a bit, so the method was actually built, uh, it was actually built to uh, estimate an individual's physical activity intensity. So it was developed by Borg in uh, 1998 and multiplying the, multiplying the Borg RPE score by 10 actually provides an approximation of actual heart rate for the activity that how are you doing at that time. So a standard protocol was actually followed in our experiments to verbally ask the participant every minute uh, how they are feeling about the activity. And the participants have the scale of this sort in front of them. They are well educated about uh, like, what does it mean to be uh, in a very light level of exertion stage? And then uh, the participants have the scale so they can choose and report their exertion levels based on how they feel in uh, while doing the experiments, while doing the manual material handling tasks. And uh, this RPE was actually chosen to be our definition of fatigue accumulated by an individual. So this was something that we chose that, okay, how do you define fatigue? It's all about predicting fatigue, but we had to define fatigue first. And this was something that we went on. So once we have the data collection comes in the part where we start analyzing the data sets. So uh, this was something that we have been using. Uh, so some insights on the metrics. Uh, so it's minute ventilation. So it's one of many parameters that we were able to receive in real time using the Hexoskin API. And uh, it's actually the total volume of air inhaled for one minute. And uh, at rest, it can be between six to eight liters per minute and uh, one can reach uh, around 160 liters per minute during high intensity activity. And one of the crucial parts, this was available in real time by, uh, by Hexaskin. So just to give a little, uh, so this was uh, the plots here actually represent uh, the time in seconds on X axis and the minute ventilation in milliliters per minutes uh, for the Y axis. And for our experiments, uh, we were able to actually categorize the intensity that the subjects were performing on. So uh, we got different sets, different data sets. We differentiated as male subjects and the female subjects. And based on the ranges of the activity, we classified them as uh, moderate, moderate, heavy, and heavy. So we were actually able to visualize the differences in the intensity of activity that every male and female participant did. And uh, in males, uh, as you can see, uh, we uh, noticed that ones at a moderate pace uh, stayed in those levels longer, uh, not so as you increase the pace. 
and uh, in females, uh, no such differences except the heavy intensity wasn't recorded for as uh, for much as long as compared to the males, male population. So uh, we can also see that we neither achieved uh, the rest or the maximal intensity of the activity during our data collection methods. So, uh, yeah. So now uh, all the moderate and about so uh, the activity was actually stopped when the subject mentioned that they are they can no longer go beyond an RPE of eighteen that they are eighteen or nineteen that they are maximally exerted. So that's where the full stop was. Taking next step ahead on the analysis. Uh, it was actually followed by doing some regression modeling on how we can utilize this data to actually uh, collect all this data collected in real time and how we can create models to predict fatigue. So uh, with the so after the data collection of all the parameters that we have in real time, such as breathing rate, minute ventilation, heart rate, time of the activity, height of the table, weight of the box, and time interval between each lift and lowering motion, next step was to perform an exploratory factor analysis uh, to uncover the underlying relationships uh, between, uh, under, to actually understand what factors actually play an important role in fatigue, in the accumulation of fatigue of an individual. And that was then followed by the regression modeling to actually predict uh, the RPE, that's fatigue in a person. And in the end, we evaluated and created the model. So talking a bit about the factor analysis. So we're trying to isolate what these different factors explain. So uh, what the, uh, and we are in here looking at the results, we were actually able to see the commonalities. As the results show us, the minute ventilation, uh, breathing rate, heart rate, we were actually, they were all numerically grouped under the factor called ML3, the red box at the top left of the picture. So uh, you can see that they were grouped. So that means we were able to separate this, that yes, the breathing rate and these three physiological factors can be grouped together. ML3 can be actually regarded as the physiological factor in general. And that is actually explaining the 24% of the variability. And next to that, with 15% of variability each are the time interval of the activity and the height of lift and lower. And at last, at around 11% of the variability was defined by the weight that the subjects were carrying. And based on these factors that we considered, a linear model was created. And this analysis was then used uh, to actually generate these mathematical equations so we can predict our P levels. So given the level of strain in an individual due to the indication of VO2 uh, that is actually provided by Hexoscan in real time, uh, we were able to classify and generate models to accurately predict RPE on separate levels of intensity, moderate, heavy, and moderate, heavy. So here I have an example of the moderate heavy and heavy intensity plots for two male subjects analyzed on an out of sample data set. So uh, the test cases that you see here are not something that we use the models to train on. This is an out of sample test that we are using our equations to test the model. So, and as you can see on the X, -ax X axis, we have time and on Y axis, we have RPE. Uh, and it's actually showing how different models behave when we compare them to each other. So on the self-reported RPE, uh, you see the red with the staircase nature and uh, no smoothing was done to that particular data set. And we can clearly see that the linear model in the cyan greenish color is much closer to the actual RPE with the mean absolute error of around 1.07 in the uh, moderate heavy intensity and uh, around 1.53 in prediction uh, in, in the heavy intensity males. And these models uh, were then fed to a dashboard that we created using Unity, utilizing the Hexoskin API, uh, connecting the device via Bluetooth Low Energy to a Python application and uh, receiving the performance metrics in real time. So the application was then designed to send the data to Unity for visualization 
of the digital twin using Microsoft HoloLens. So next, I have a demo for the attendees showcasing the conceptual digital twin with real-time feedback system developed in our lab here. A digital twin is an avatar copy of a material handling worker mirroring human motion as the worker performs the task. Wearables mounted in the worker monitor physiological activity. This system enables real-time health and ergonomic assessment and optimization. The avatar is created by optical motion capture cameras, which read reflective markers mounted in the workers. A hexoskin suit tracks the workers' ECG, heart rate, and oxygen consumption. Our team replicated manual material handling activities to test the digital twin. Audio and visual cues are triggered when a wrong motion is detected. Such feedback attempts to reduce workers' injuries during repetitive moves. The dashboard displays real-time indicators, such as workers' fatigue, heart rate, and task statistics. Data-driven models predict the rate of perceived exertion an estimate of fatigue measured in the Borg scale. An augmented reality application was created using Unity and Qualysis SDK. Avatar's advanced graphics and visualizations generated in Microsoft HoloLens submerged the user in a more realistic environment. Digital twin technology brings material handling workers closer to Industry 4.0, increasing their safety, facilitating their training, and connecting them to smart devices. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and our research interests you. So our current development is towards adding and understanding more physiological parameters to our data collection and closing the gap between uh, the lab-based data to a factory floor. Uh, so currently our team is actually working on alternatives uh, for the precise optical motion capture camera systems by using machine learning based pose estimation methods uh, using low cost off the shelf video cameras and explore the possibilities of developing a dashboard uh, to provide real-time feedback to the operators working on a factory floor. And with the ultimate goal of uh, creating a digital twin of a human operator for a safe working environment. Thank you for your time. And uh, here's my contact information for more, uh, for, for more info. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Abhimanyu, for giving us, again, a different perspective into how our health monitoring platform and smart garments can be applied to digital twins and in an industrial setting to predict fatigue and prevent injuries in manufacturing. We're really looking forward to seeing uh, your, your lab and your work progress from the laboratory and moving into the Toyota plant and other manufacturing facilities to keep people in the workplace healthier and safer. So thank you for all of your continued work and, and thank you for showing us how the hexoskin can be applied in real time to make those uh, solutions really a reality. So again, thank you. 
Um, so this concludes our presentation. We do have uh, just one quick question here for Dr. Buasi. Uh, Lisa uh, Massini has been asking if you could speak to us briefly about how you're going to be using those rep respiratory metrics to enhance your model for seizure detection. So Dr. Buasi, I'll uh, turn it over to you quickly as we just wrap up and conclude our presentation. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk about it quickly. So uh, I didn't mention, but like as you know, so we, we the, the respiration is already recorded by the HexoSkin Smart Shirt the, since the patients are wearing it. So what we'll do, we'll follow a similar methodology to what I explained today for ECG. So we'll be extracting features from the respiratory signals, such as breathing rate, breathing volume, et cetera. And we'll be using these features as input for the classifier for seizure detection. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. And again, uh, if anybody would like to uh, contact any of our presenters, you can uh, you know, email us and we can contact you directly to them or again, use the QR codes that we presented earlier. So again, thank you to both Dr. Buasi and, and Abby Manu for uh, their great presentations on how HexoSkin can be used um, to develop um, AI models for real-time solutions. Again, thank you to all of our guests for attending, for staying with us till the very end here. We do invite you to visit our website for the latest news, for details about our upcoming products, upcoming releases. And if you've already not subscribed to receive our newsletters, please do subscribe to our newsletter and you can receive news and invitations to future events. So we will be hosting another webinar uh, towards the end of November, looking at stress in the healthcare industry. And we'll be hearing again from some panelists about how they're using HexoSkin to uh, monitor and detect and prevent stress and burnout from affecting our healthcare workers. Uh, we do have one final question here from Laura Schmidt um, asking about the feedback of users about the usage of the warning systems in your digital twin environment. So Abhi Manu, I'm not sure if you have a, a message there that you can answer. Maybe you can answer live and quickly answer Laura's question. Yeah, uh, we're actually testing the feedback system that we have built uh, with various industry partners on application of personalized warning systems, since that is something that would be specifically made for each and every individual. So it's in the testing phase, right? Perfect. Thank you very much. So again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. If you do have any further questions, don't hesitate to email us and we are looking forward to speaking with you all soon. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.